After The Shadow of Slavery was published in 1972, I co-authored with Ray Smock a book on the photo photographer Francis Benjamin Johnston and wrote a book on the 1927 Mississippi River flood. Increasingly, I became intrigued with why change had come so rapidly to the southern countryside in the mid-20th century. When I left for college in 1957, my hometown of Spring Hope, North Carolina, was flooded with farmers on Saturday as they shopped, bought haircuts, watched movies at the Joyce Theater, shared a beer, shot pool, and roamed the streets socializing. On Saturday nights, there was a major square dance at the WPA-built community building about 100 yards from my house and cars parked in the field across the street. In addition to incredible country music, screeching tires, and loud mufflers, there was liquor and sex, the residue of which we discovered Monday afternoon when we cleared the field of liquor bottles and signs of sexual activity so we could play ball. The Baptist preacher finally shut the dance down. By the time I went to the University of Maryland in 1966 to work on the PhD, my hometown was deserted on Saturday afternoons and pretty much deserted all week. Obviously, mechanization and chemicals had a lot to do with this, as did the, the appearance of shopping malls. But I discovered that I had not properly factored in agri-government. The USDA, that is the United States Department of Agriculture, and its broad reach into rural America. My notions of the transfer transformation of southern agriculture changed drastically, and the process was far more nuanced than I had suspected and far more interesting. After Senator Morgan's defeat, I ended up in the fall of 1981 at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, then housed in the Smithsonian Castle, wrote a draft of Breaking the Land, and then found a home in the National Museum of History in 1982. Why have I all so often focused on farmers? Perhaps because my grandfather was a tobacco farmer and I heard him bitch and moan about USDA policies when I worked for him during the summers, too young then to really understand why his tobacco acreage allotment was reduced every year. I have written primarily about poor farmers, black and white, most of whom were ultimately devoured by agribusiness and agri-government. As my analysis has matured, my interpretation of bureaucratic deviousness has become more biting. The USDA was infused with a notion of modernism that swept across the world during the years surrounding the turn of the 20th century. And in this country was epitomized by the progressive era country life movement. And this faith in progress through science and technology, a concept that matured during the New Deal years. The Soviet Union fondly embraced modernism, and landowners and skilled farmers were eliminated, that is, killed. And the government set up communes and furnished tractors and implements. Uh, the Soviet Union bought 27,000 tractors from the US. And envisioning what anthropologist James C. Scott labeled rural high modernism. Experts from the United States helped this experiment along, excitedly experimenting and implementing large farm operations that used machines and organizational structures they could never attempt at home. While the Soviet road to modernism sacrificed, that is again killed, between four and 20 million farmers, the New Deal's Agricultural Adjustment Administration provided a platform to support mechanization and scientific agriculture by subsidizing the more successful farmers, the very class that the Soviets eliminated. In the US, it would not be the government that bought tractors, implements, and chemicals, but rather successful farmers subsidized by the USDA. Subsidies were passed down from Washington to states to counties, where committees composed of wealthy farmers dispersed funds and implemented policy that favored their class. It was county elites that implemented USDA programs that reconfigured the countryside to suit their ambition. Along the way, millions of poor farmers left the land. Agricultural policies are so opaque that I doubt 10 people in the country could explain the hundreds of programs, many of them contradictory. The dense regulations hide shameless favoritism. In 1995, the nonprofit Environmental Working Group 
analyzed how much of USDA payments had gone to the county committee members and the office staff over the previous decade. They set the figure at $2.3 billion. Committee members, the analysis found, received on average $14,000 a year. Employees in the offices, some $8,000 a year, while the farmers outside received an average of $7,000 a year. Farmers elected these county committee members, and the USDA declared this program the epitome of democracy, although, as I conclude in dispossession, the elections were flawed and undemocratic. Present USDA programs continue this system without apology and at great expense. Museum work often left little time for scholarly research, but at the same time, I found that some projects pushed the boundaries of my usual historical inquiry. Research for the exhibit Science in American Life led to an article on fire ants and later the book Toxic Drift. Our team turned up new sources and raised serious questions about pesticide toxicity and radiation sickness. Our sponsor, the American Chemical Society, leaned on us to focus on the glory of science, which we did. But we also featured troubling issues with the Manhattan Project, nuclear testing, pesticides, and we also added what I label the Rachel Carson Shrine. Although the curatorial team met regularly with a panel of scientists and historians of science, the ACS charged that the exhibit was flawed, biased against science. I remain proud of this exhibit, especially of not yielding to the pressure to change history to suit the sponsor. More important, I would never have written on pesticides had I not worked on this exhibit, nor would I have gotten to go to Hanford, Washington to look at the first reactors, go inside one, and have a man who ran it during World War II explain its operation. I asked him what, it, what was it like here in the middle of the night when you were sitting with this reactor making plutonium. He said, oh, it's just a pumping station. It's just water going through pipes. We collected one of the control panels, which in it, when we found it was this green thing with things pulled out of it, but when they restored it, it was this beautiful object that we put in the exhibit. Even as we were busily putting together the science exhibit, I was invited to give the Commonwealth Fund lecture at University College London in 1992. I was at a desperate loss for a topic. As the clock ticked and my nerves frayed, a friend returned a New Deal legal study analyzing the status of sharecroppers as it related to government payments. Paging through this 40-page study before I filed it, I became curious about how the New Deal agricultural policies might have changed farmers' relationship to the law. I went to the law library and began reading through relevant cases of farmers settling their disputes in local courts before a jury of peers. When the Agricultural Adjustment Administration created county committees, these men, they were all white men, heard most of the disputes and basically usurped traditional judicial prerogatives. I had a correct hunch that law reviews would comment on this change and these leads explored, uh, exploded into a wealth of information. Moving farmers out of county courts with a jury of peers and systematic rep record keeping and into county agricultural committees and ad hoc decisions ended accountability. Even in the 1980s, attorneys seeking to challenge county agricultural committee decisions were forced to secure committee decisions and appeals through freedom of information actions and go through them one by one searching for continuity and precedent. Unlike highly organized court records, these decisions were in no systematic order. They were not filed by precedent. They were not consistent. Favoritism, one might argue fraud, ran through county committee decisions. As I went deeper into the law, I discovered that government acreage allotment policy ultimately became commodified and increased the value of farmland and eventually could be rented or sold. The Commonwealth Fund lecture, in my estimation, was one of the most original I've given. Had not that New Deal legal study turned up so opportunely, I would have had to do some terrible rehash. What turned out to be the Rock and Soul Social Crossroads exhibit took a decade to mature, and before it was over, our team had done video interviews with nearly 100 people connected with the music business in Memphis. 
When I grew up in small town in the small town South, listening to Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, Rufus and Carla Thomas, and hearing about Sam Phillips, Sun Studio, and Jim Stewart's Stack Studio, it never crossed my mind that one day I would sit across from them and interview them. Because the American History Museum never raised funds for the exhibit, Memphis supporters lured it there, and it opened in 2000, and it's still flourishing. I used some of the interview material in Lost Revolutions, and then when the Atlanta History Center asked me to help curate an exhibit on star car racing, I eagerly signed up. Although funds were never raised to install the exhibit, we interviewed some 50 men and women connected with the stock car racing business including Junior Johnson, Richard Petty, Darrell Waltrip, Benny Parsons, Louise Smith, and Ned Jarrett. I used the same excellent video team that had worked with me on the Rock and Soul exhibit, real pros. I mean, the, these, are, these interviews are now at the American History Museum and the Archive Center, and uh, they're a valuable collection. Oral history was also crucial in my latest book. Dwayne Cox, archivist at Auburn University, mentioned to me when I was doing research that Willie Strain was still alive. And he was living in Tuskegee, just a short distance away. And this lead proved crucial in understanding the integration of the Federal Extension Service. I went to Tuskegee and interviewed both Willie Strain and Bertha Jones, both of whom had worked in what was called then the Negro Extension Service that was located at Tuskegee University. Then in 1965, they went to Auburn, where they were assigned offices, shunned, and given nothing to do. Bertha Jones had headed the 4-H program for African-American girls, and Strain had edited The Negro Farmer, a newspaper featuring 4-H news, articles on farmers, advice, and encompassing coverage of African-American life in the rural South. After the summer of 1965, it was no longer published, as if news about African-American farmers was no longer important. The Alabama Cooperative Extension Service deemed these two top administrators of the Negro Extension Service irrelevant. To make a long story short, Strain sued and brought the Alabama Cooperative Extension Service to its knees. And the suit set precedent for other African-American ex extension workers in the South to file similar suits. 